When I began the series in late January, I was fresh off the heels of a trip to Washington, D.C., and was honestly, if you recall, uh, frustrated by those of us in academia and many of us in the policy uh, sector who don't think enough about organizing, nor do we think enough about power. And my premise since that particular visit is that we talk too much about ideas and not enough about the raw ne necessities of putting those ideas into action. No one better is uh, available to us to get at that, uh, uh, the consequences of that thought than John Passacantando, uh, the ex-executive uh, director of Greenpeace USA, um, one of the great happy warriors of this fantastic progressive movement that we are part of here in the 21st century. John has visited our campus at Middlebury, I guess, three times now, and always lights a fire under all of us because of his brains and his soul. Um, we are so honored to have him here today. He's going to tell you more uh, in a moment about what he's up to now uh, and how it matters to the kinds of things that you all are doing, particularly you all who are undergraduates, and ultimately how it reflects on our getting to 350. Um, as I introduce John, I'm also happy to re-welcome Will Bates of 350.org, one of our previous speakers. It's nice to see folks coming back. I take that as a good sign. Um, so, John, thanks so much for being here, and we look forward to learning a bunch from you today. Thank you, John. Yeah, I think I don't need that. Thank you very much. Um, I've heard a lot about the series, watched some of it online, and uh, it is an honor to be both uh, introduced by one of my heroes, John Isham, who I think is one of the great sort of secret radicals in the way he knows how to teach and inspire people to do the right thing. Um, I've, I've just seen him teach with an amazing amount of leverage. And then to uh, be here as part of something that uh, the great Dr. Costanza has put together, who is in some ways a protege of, of the ecological economists that uh, I used as justification for dropping out of graduate school in economics, which uh, makes it all the more weird that I'm at a university talking and um, on solutions. Because I remember once when I was um, doing some organizing, always around global warming, um, somebody who had a, um, another small nonprofit next to the one that I was running came to me and said, hey, we ought to put our brains together. I think we could work, work together. He, he said, here's what I do. I, I sit both sides down and we really try to sort of solve things and get to common ground. He said, what do you do again? And I said, I try to cause the biggest shit fight and just isolate everyone and then we can reassemble. He said, I don't think that's going to work. I said, no, I'm pretty sure it's not. Plus, I have more fun. Um, so what I named this talk is Reboot, Reboot the Environmental Movement. Um, first, let me start with just the, the really quick history of the modern environmental movement, the quick, even cheaper and quicker than Cliff Notes. All right? So you get, you know, Rachel Carson stuns the world with this revelation that, you know, ecology is a real thing, right? That everything's interconnected. Before that, it was pretty much the, the Taoist mystics that understood that, and they would get there from meditating, and they would realize that everything was interconnected, and everybody thought they were smoking too much opium. Rachel Carson roots it in science. She does various experiments. Everybody starts to notice. The osprey, the eagles are sitting on their eggs, are cracking the shells. This builds and builds and builds, and there's a lot of obvious visual pollution in front of us. The Cuyahoga River catches on fire. They can't put it out because they've dumped so many pollutants in it. And that leads to the first Earth Day, 1970, um, where you have this sort of really wonderful, mass, peaceful, gentle uprising. And you have the Nixon administration that will do anything to take the attention of all the people they're killing in Southeast Asia. And they say, yeah, 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 Earth Day, yeah, good, good, get whatever, whatever. No, it doesn't matter. Anything so you stop looking over there. And lo and behold, Richard Nixon becomes the greatest environmental president of modern history, signing into law the National Environmental Policy Act, which gives us uh, the Council on Environmental Quality at the White House, the Environmental Protection Agency, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, Safe Drinking Water Act, the Wilderness Act, and many others that I can't remember. And you know, industry really kind of takes it in the shorts um, and doesn't like this. And slowly begins to really deploy much more aggressive uh, means to block and stop this stuff. So the whole greenwash industry is built. 
it's not that it wasn't there. Rachel Carson, there was a firm that was hired to, identify, to go after Rachel Carson, to insinuate that she was a lesbian, to do all sorts of things to discredit Rachel Carson. And uh, to, to, be, to have, people, have there be innuendo that you're a lesbian when you're an important writer in the 1960s was a very difficult thing. So they were trying to undermine her in all sorts of ways. But it was a couple hundred thousand dollar campaign. Absolutely chump change. So throughout the 70s, 80s, and 90s, a really sophisticated greenwash industry grows, which is a huge industry in Washington. Um, and at the same time, it becomes extremely expensive to run campaigns because they go to television, right? So if you want to, if you want to get elected to political office, to national political office, unless you're a completely outside the box politician like a, a, a Wellstone or somebody, you got to raise a lot of money. There's really only two places that money could come from. This may have changed a little bit in the Obama era, but it had to come from big corporations or unions, right? Mostly corporations. So at the same time, our environmental issues go from being very direct, we can see it, it's a problem, people don't like pollution, litter, you, you could measure it, you got lead in gasoline, you can directly correlate that and show the causation to the low IQ uh, in, in babies. Easier stuff, clear cuts, um, still tough fights, not taking anything away from them, but then you you, 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 you bridge this, this gap here, and now you're dealing with something that's invisible, CO2, a naturally occurring gas. In fact, the, the occurrence of CO2 gives, enables life on the planet. So now it's a little more complicated. It's not just a pollutant. It's something that we naturally exhale. Oh, and another problem. It's not just one industry. It's not a little problem here. It's not like saving the ozone layer um, where you've got you know, a couple of dozen really nasty gases produced by three companies. They sit them down, they suspend antitrust, and they say, come on, let's cut a deal here. Let's stop making the really bad ones. We'll give you really new long patents, patent life in the less bad ones, and you'll make even more money. Great. So we, you know, do a little bit of protection for the ozone layer. That gets really different when we identify greenhouse gases as a problem. Suddenly, we've aligned some of the most powerful industries in humankind. We've inadvertently organized them together and arrayed them against us. And they use all this architecture and infrastructure of the greenwash movement. And that's what we have now. So when we get frustrated, we say, oh, why is it taking so long? I mean, this is terrible. And well, because we have to look at what we're up against. So we're up against an absolutely impressive um, array of opponents. So what worked in the old movement was a great sort of liberal trope. Knowledge is power. Knowledge is power. So we teach our people, here's the problem, turn that into policy, have environmental groups, um, educate the public, go to Congress, say we got a problem here, here's how you solve it, Congress has to water it down, and you got something of a solution, right? Knowledge is power. Now we're up against guys who, opponents, who don't believe knowledge is power. Power is power, right? What they can drive is power. What they can convince, what they can tell Fox News to say is reality. So I actually still believe that knowledge is power, and I still believe that the right thing will ultimately happen, but we'll be dead by then. Right? It doesn't happen fast enough. We're going to stop using oil because we're going to run out of it. Right? We may be just before, just after, right at peak oil. Right? So maybe we're only going to burn um, petroleum in automobiles for another 10, 15, 20, but not more than 50 years. But then it's too late. Right? It's, too la it's too late to protect the stuff that we love. Right? So now let's look at how the other, other guys are fighting. Right? Are you all aware of the attacks on the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change? So just think of that. Two weeks before the most important international gathering of all time on global warming, the greatest challenge humankind has ever caused and faced and tried to address, two weeks before it, the entire thing is built on the peer-reviewed science that comes through 
the independent intergovernmental panel on climate change that works as a subgroup of the United Nations, two weeks before that, somebody rolls out the fact that somehow they got a hold of several thousand emails and about 12 of them are basically professors being petty. That's the full extent of it. They didn't find a lie. They didn't find manipulation of data. They found that a handful of professors were being petty. But by the way they framed that and rolled that out simultaneously through a network that's global, it is now the climate story of the day. And the polling of how much we believe global warming is a problem and needs to be addressed, those numbers are dropping in a significant way. Mainstream voters in the United States. That's what we're up against, right? We're up against a massive hit job that could have been paid for by, I don't know, the Saudi government, Peabody Coal, Duke Energy, the Southern Company. We won't know for maybe 10, 15 years until somebody maybe on their deathbed says, yeah, this was a great hit. I was part of this. Or maybe I feel really guilty now. You know, the story will eventually come out. There was too many people involved. But the point is, that's what we're up against. Why? Why are we up against that? Because every powerful entity in the world, or in our country, let's keep it to the US, the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, the unions, and large corporations, every single one of them uses opposition work. Every single one of them, right? So now I'm not saying that we in the environmental movement should do the same thing they do. But I'm saying that unless we build a whole wing of the environmental movement that knows how to manage our opposition based on it's got to be legal and it's got to be ethical, but it's a whole new way of looking at who our opponents are and where we want to get and how we want to get there, and that if we don't, they're laughing at us as we're sitting here waiting for them to adopt are good ideas. The reason our ideas haven't been adopted is not because they're not good or smart, or that people, once they, we've explained it to them, don't want to do it. It's because we're allied, we're, array, we're up against this amazing power. So, and unless we do that, we can't advance the objectives of environmentalists, social entrepreneurs, the venture capitalists who are pushing all this clean, clean tech, Green tech. So first, I want to say what, what this doesn't look like. It's not this sort of macho, blind aggression where we're like, we're finally going to hit them back the way they hit us. It's not that. In fact, to me, that is the thinking of children of empire, right? Children of em by, by children of empire, I mean, so we live in it. We know we live in an empire, kind of on its, its downside. But in an empire, when our government wants something, it goes and gets it, right? It uses brute force. It wants to control oil in the Mideast. It comes up with a, a, a pretext for invading Iraq, right? It doesn't like things going on in Afghanistan. It does a full-on invasion. It uses the concept that came out of the whole development of the concept of the nation state that came out of the Treaty of Westphalia, total war, right? We didn't see total war in this country until about World War I. Repeat, World War II. But the concept, right? This is not just the domain of the Henry Kissingers, right? It seeped into us. What do I mean by that? Look at our culture. You take something I think is, and, and I'm not actually knocking these things, right? I love, like, the, let's say the Star Wars series, right? So, all the really cool stuff in Star Wars was a direct ripoff from ancient China. It's Tai Chi, right? These Jedi Knights, you know, they, they, they can manipulate your mind. They have, they have these extra powers, right? These are not the droids you're looking for, right? And the guy, these are not the droids you're looking for, and then they've moved his mind. There are Tai Chi masters who can do that today. But what's so weird, what's so funny about that movie, of course, again, I love the movie. I've watched it many times sat my daughters down and watched it with them, is that if you really had those kind of powers, right, why would you end, why would the final scene involve total war? Total war, right? Both sides, great. 
same thing in the final scenes in um, Lord of the Rings. Same things in the final scenes of, um, of Avatar. Now, again, these are all movies and series of movies that I love. But what I'm trying to point out is, if you had those extra skills, you wouldn't end up by marching all your young people into hails of lead or lasers or whatever is coming at you, right? No, you would be, these are the droids you're not looking for, right? So everything that I'm about to go into, I ripped off from Sun Tzu, who was a military strategist about 300 BC, who wrote in a period when China, which was then the known universe, had come out of what's called the Warring States period, which was essentially 150 years of World War II. One kingdom, another kingdom, everybody's trying to establish dominance. And they, in the process, they destroy all of their wealth. Generations of young people, amazing amounts of wealth, all chewed up to siege castles. So Sun Tzu starts saying things like, the brilliant general is not the one who's won every battle, but the one who's met his objectives without firing a shot, right? It's very difficult to think that way when you're, the, when you're a child of an empire. Because as a child of an empire, we like, you know, we like solving things the way Tony Soprano solves things, right? It's fun. I like it. I love watching The Sopranos. But it doesn't work worth a damn in real life. Ironically, and I'm not, this is not a talk about empires, but ironically, it doesn't even work for empires, right? Because we're losing in Afghanistan and Iraq, right? At least if it was working for the empire, you could say, well, it's an ugly way of doing business, but it seems to work. It doesn't even work for empires. So you can imagine how it doesn't work for individuals or the environmental movement. So I'm not talking about that. On the other hand, I'm not talking about sort of a Christian concept of turning the other cheek, right? So it's neither of those things. So, so what does it look like? It looks like the human immune system, right? What does a human immune system do? It sees an invader, some kind of errant cell, some kind of virus, and it has to figure out, it has to design its own defenses, it has to figure out a way to kill that without harming the other systems, all the complicated systems that we still don't even fully understand in Western science that operate in the body, right? In Western science, the best we can do when we deal with this, and all of us here have somebody we know where we've dealt with cancer, and the way we deal with cancer is we have to do total war. We do chemo and we redo radiation. We blast it. But we're weak after we do that because we couldn't just isolate the cancer cell, right? Someday our medicine's gonna be so good, we will. We'll know how to do that, right? So that's the difference between this sort of total war and this other thing that I'm just gonna call opposition management. So if you read Sun Tzu, you know, you can read it over and over. And it's weird, it's cryptic, it's, it keeps repeating itself. It's supposed to rhyme, but it doesn't rhyme the way it probably did in its, in its original. Um, and there's weird chapters on like incendiary devices and the use of misinformation and spying. And actually none of that is my point, right? The point when you read this is the, whole, is the concept of complementarity. So we do this stuff we fight in the environmental field because we believe in ecology, that all things are connected, that if you harm any one thing, you harm something else, right? Complementarity, sort of the, the ancient yin and yang, that contrasting or even contradictory concepts that represent different perspectives on reality together are more comprehensive, comprehensive than one of them alone. In other words, black and white don't represent good and bad, they just represent different things. Or you could take it to, from an English romantic, William Blake, The Auguries of Innocence, and he wrote, to see a world in a grain of sand and heaven in a wild flower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. Beautiful, lovely, but what is he talking about? Complementarity. doesn't work when you're in the mindset of empire. In the mindset of empire, there's good, there's evil. 
right? Just think of the, the speech that George Bush used. If it wasn't that George Bush was such a freak, that speech worked for the children of empire. So in other words, contradictory forces are interconnected, interdependent in the natural world. And if you, and that's ecology, and if you add humans and our history and our culture, you have a social ecology. Social ecology. So how does that work? How do we embrace a concept of social ecology to help us deploy winning campaigns? Because that's really, that's what I do. That's what I care about, right? I, to try to think of this, I, the way I, I, I play with this, is you know oftentimes when we're trying to do these campaigns we have these timelines right so we do the strategy and we do the next thing and then the tactics and then we do this and you know and then we deploy and then we get here and then we've won or lost right what I try to do instead as I try to make myself keep thinking of this complementarity is I try to think of how can I put this stuff in a wheel, right? So in a wheel, I put the objective in the middle. But then I'm, I'm going to try to map out a social ecology, right? Because in a, if we really want to be powerful in this, we have to know ourselves our strengths, our weaknesses, our ego. What's really driving us? We have to know our opponent. But we have to know them both at any given time. We have to be thinking about it. When you think of a strategy that you're going to deploy, or that at any given time you may have to discard, or that you may have to redeploy. Seems kind of weird, right? Why don't you just come up with a plan and stick to it? Well, because you might learn something different, right? And if you force yourself to have some humility, it might help offset our own arrogance, or to understand the arrogance of our opponent, or to use the arrogance of our opponent, or to use our own arrogance to help us in this. It's all going on at the same time. If you're aware that we're operating within an empire, And that at any given time, empires are being born and they're collapsing. And that's happened at the grand scale and at the small scale. And we want to know about the landscape. Who, who, who are our opponents? Who can give us what, what, what we want? But more than that, what are the hidden tensions out there? What are the hidden tensions? If you think of the way a tree surgeon has to work, the tree surgeon has to look at something dealing with tons of weight up in the air. It's an incredibly dangerous thing. So a tree looks like it wants to fall that way. But oftentimes they have all these different things from the way they grew, from the way the wind blew them 20, 30 years earlier. There's shakes in them. There's built-in tensions. So they start cutting here, and the tree starts to twist this way. Start cutting a branch. They were, it was positive. They're, it's obvious it's coming down this way it swings a little differently. That's life or death to, a, to an arborist, right? So there are these tensions that aren't so obvious that are in there. And then there's deceptions. Whether we're deceiving our opponents intentionally or we're inadvertently deceiving ourselves, which is more the case, the whole concept of, uh, you know what they mean by self-defense? The real kung fu masters, when they talk about self-defense, it's not defending yourself from a mugger on the street. It's defending yourself from your own ego. 
because that's the real threat. They can teach anybody how to punch, kick, roll, jujitsu, but they can't help. They, the, it takes the longest and is often impossible to, 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 to teach you the moves to block that. You've got, when you start thinking about marketing, or I'll link it to another word we don't always want to see it linked with, inspiration. We've got to love this stuff. We've got to wind people up to come with us. But at the same time, sometimes we believe our own bullshit, right? So the flip side of that, I call kill the dogma. What do I mean by that? Well, think of, we're going to speak truth to power. Truth to power? So that implies we have no power, which is not true, and that we're the only ones with the truth, which is, goes back to the arrogance. Like, we're not the only ones with the truth. There's a lot of truths out there. So a fun way to go through this now is to play with this. I'll do it for about 10 minutes, and then I'll take any questions you want is let's just play with some issues on this wheel, right? We'll bounce them around. So let's look at the coal industry, right? We've got to put the coal industry out of business, or we can't solve global warming. We know that. The basic math is there. If we continue to grind up mountains and burn them, not only do we have a list of problems as long as our arm, we also have CO2, excess CO2 in the air. So what do we do? We're in a total war fight with the coal industry. And for the first time in the coal industry's history, the corporations are aligned with the unions. It took a lot to do that. The coal companies, only 80 years ago, when the miners would strike, would literally set up machine gun pillboxes and fire down in on the miners with their wives and children. How we got those guys to, to come together took a lot, right? But they're unified in blocking solutions to global warming. But that teaches us that there's some old tensions there, right? And maybe they can be split apart. And maybe they can be split apart. There's tensions within, amongst the oil companies. If you're Chevron, you don't want to look like ExxonMobil ever. You don't want anybody to confuse you. It's a terrible thing to have ExxonMobil represent your industry if you're in an oil company. And guys at BP have told me so. Think of what's going on with this, with the, the health care debate, right? Which is a kind of a fun one for me to look at because I'm not too close to it, right? The health care debate. For one, the far right, driven by the teabaggers, they took a total war approach on it. They're gonna, we are going to deny Obama this victory, which means we're going to deny the country this victory. But we don't care. Because if we deny him this victory, it's going to really hurt him in the midterms. And maybe he can't even get reelected. It's not necessarily wrong. It's not necessarily a bad strategy. Except that it's all or nothing. It's totally binary. What, are the, what, are, what do they lose? Now. The Republicans are allied with masses of groups who yell racial epithets. And it didn't even work. So now their supercharged, unhinged, angry base <laughs> is even angrier. But who are they angry at? Well, they were angry at a black man, for one thing, right? And they're going to stay angry at him. But now they're angry at their own leaders who couldn't stop this bill. They sent their money in. They marched. They showed up with all those little signs. So. That was a total war approach. All or nothing. Got to dominate. Got to destroy, crush, kill the other side. Newspapers love the total war story. So they lure us into it. So we're not just children of empire. We are children of empire who read everything through the eyes of empire. Because that's the way the New York Times covers it. It's the way, that is the way we tell stories. To me, it's all fine. I'm not saying we should tell our stories differently. It's because that's this. I do this. I love that. Right? I ran Greenpeace. We got to do this. We raise $200 million a year globally. Right? There's a little boat. 
There's the big whaling boat. We've got to stop them. And it's good. And it's real. It's sincere. It's true. We actually do save some whales. But at the same time, there's a subtle marketing campaign we're playing through Japanese soap operas. It's not worth putting in the direct mail. It's not worth explaining on the street with the clipboard. It's just not. Right? It's not insincere. It's just there's no time for this. Right? So I can do this, and then it's marketing. It's inspiration. But I don't want to just totally believe my own dogma. Right? It's not just righteousness. If it was just righteousness, I think we would have won a long time ago. Because when it comes to like the righteousness meter, we kind of win, don't we? Right? We got our parallels to the civil rights movement. I've given those speeches. I love those speeches, right? I feel righteous when I give the speech. The difference is I'm talking to people who want to be professionals in this field or who are, right? So I'm not marketing to you. Right? I'm talking to fellow professionals. Fellow professionals need to avoid the dogma. We can't believe our own bullshit. And we have to be those master strategists who understand whether it's in an ancient context of the art of war or a modern context of how we're going to undermine and weaken our opponents, but not get sort of lured in to Nothing but this sort of emotionalism. I have another quote that I want to give you, but now I have to find it. And it's not going to be Chinese. You like that Chinese? Eh, I can't find that one. So. Let's see, do I have any other examples I want to put up there? You're going to ask, you're going to give me questions of those other examples. So the, the key is at any time, any one of these things is as relevant as any other. It's not like I've deployed my campaign and I'm at this point in my campaign, so don't ask me this. Okay? It's not an excuse to just sit around and keep talking all day. It's not that. It's instead, it's about you're always getting new information. You're always trying to be aware of who you are and of who your opponent is. And staying humble, but understanding arrogance. And able to deploy, discard, redeploy. Understanding that you're within this context of empire, which is not bad, right? We'll get back to the complementarity thing. Actually, there's not good and bad. They just are. They both are. Yes, your spouse may tell you it's bad to be arrogant. This is not about that, right? This is about being a strategist and figuring out what is the pathway. How can I get what I want? And the context here of getting what I want is not to be the richest hedge fund guy. The context is to save the environment, protect the environment, right? Which, is, which already meets um, the initial criteria that it's, it's sort of going with the natural order of the universe. So how can I get there and use the least number of resources and not play this game of total war? Because we can never win that. But even the empires that play that way have all ultimately failed that way. So one more quote. Alan Watts, I'm going to the far west now, California. Um, when you get free from certain fixed concepts of the way the world is, you find it is far more subtle and far more miraculous than what you thought it was. Right? And to me, that is environmental war. It's far more subtle. It's far more miraculous. It is not the black and white that the newspapers give us every day. It's magical, it's scary, it's everything's at stake. It's not just, oh, it's so depressing. It's not any of that. It's all of that. All right, thank you. Now you're going to do questions. Do you, need, you don't need the mic for questions, do you? Or John, are you going to moderate or do something?
need the mic for our online friends. Yes, that's right. So that's what's happening. So I'm going to start with a question, John. I love what you put up, and I think it's a lot of food for thought for us. So as I hear you talk, I, I certainly think of this social ecology. I think it's really important. And if I were an undergrad sitting there in particular, I would be saying to myself, I need to assess the situation in a very pragmatic way, assess the quote unquote ecology of any situation that I'm looking at that I want to change, as opposed to looking at it dogmatically or in some linear way. So that's one thing I very much get out of your talk. Um, the second is I think of the work of Paul Hawken, who many of you know and who's on the advisory board for solutions, who wrote both The Ecology of Commerce and also a beautiful recent book, Blessed Unrest, which talks about humanity, in fact, as having this immune system, very much akin to what you said, John. Um, so, so I hear that and sort of the pushing back that goes on, again, in a very nonlinear fashion. Um, I'd like to draw you out a little more and maybe everybody in the audience uh, as to how it does play out with coal, which you, 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 you introduced several minutes ago. Because as you've all seen in this series, coal keeps coming back again and again. Rich Wolfson, who introduced us to this idea of getting to 350 from the science perspective, his last slide, if you recall, was coal with a red bar through it. James Hansen's article that uh, the honor students here have read and all of you should be familiar with, at least through uh, Professor Wolfson's talk, basically said if we can take care of coal in the near future, we'll be well on our way to 350. Maybe not in our lifetimes, but soon thereafter. So maybe, John, you can lead us through an exercise about how this ecological perspective applies to coal, and maybe we can all chip in a little bit, because I think, I think that that's by far the most important challenge in front of us. Um, and let me begin with a question. Coal has lots of money. Right? They can outspend us by a hundredfold. So in terms of your ecological wheel, help us to think through how we counteract that. OK, thank you. Um, well, there's, there's two ways I look at it. For one, coal is, is not coal. But it's these people who are miners, and it's these corporations. And they don't actually like each other. So these corporations have treated these guys just with not just disdain, they've killed them, right? And not just going back to the machine gun nest. So the government says, wow, these guys are getting black lung disease. We're going to put black lung monitors in the mines. So when the dust is particularly high, there'll be a meter. Well, it's too expensive. They don't want the meter going off. The company doesn't want the meter going off and the miners evacuating while they you know, vacuum out the mines. So they turn the meters off, right? So <laughs> these people and their families know that these corporations have openly killed them, right? And yet somehow we align them together. Well, I'll tell you the conversation that has never happened within the environmental movement, because we are pretty elite and we never worked in coal mines, is that we got all sorts of ideas out there, right? Any number of which. And the idea is we, we run op-eds in all the top papers, but have you ever seen a campaign where People were going to George Soros, for example, and saying, we want to put together a massive fund for these guys. I don't know. Maybe it's retraining. Maybe it's not. We don't ever talk about retraining them. We talk about, they can build wind turbines. Actually, you know, anybody who's been down there, they're not going to be building wind turbines, right? Or at least they're not. They're pretty convinced they're not going to be building wind turbines. And in much of West Virginia, they're not doing ecotourism either, right? That's a pretty hurting place, a lot of it. But if we were sincerely talking about, no, these guys need help. They need to feed their kids, right? Because right now, the two best jobs in West Virginia, you work in a prison, you work in a mine. Best paying jobs. So it would just, it's not the answer, but it's just a way. This is how you start. I, I remember I, I was talking to a group about, they, were, they, were, they wanted to, um, they, wanted, they, they were students, and they wanted to push against the Iraq war. And I said, well, I, I, I don't know exactly how to do this, but I know where the Achilles heel is on it. The military is desperate for new bodies because people don't want to be in the army anymore. It's a crummy deal. So the, not the only people, but many of the people who get recruited are poor. And they get a $10,000 signing bonus. The family's never, ever seen that kind of money, ever, right? And I was talking to a very elite 
group of people. And I said, what have you started off with? You're going to the recruiting stations. You offer them a $10,000 bonus, and you'll help them find a job. Oh, that's impossible. No, it's not impossible. We're all working for multi-million dollar organizations. We can raise that kind of money. No, maybe you can't do every potential army recruit, but what have you got to 2% of them? It'd be a heck of a story. They might actually feel diff differently about peaceniks. All right? It's just a, a stab at it. Um, so how I see you presenting this is that like we've got this huge challenge, um, largely in you know corporate money, right? And, then, and also in uh, kind of the information flows that are going on in our society. You mentioned Fox News. I think it's a great example. Um, should we be thinking about less kind of fighting the, the fights like climate change and first focusing on these kind of institutional problems? Um, I, I don't know how to word this like better, but you know, really seeing them as, as more the problem than say climate change or say like kind of more fo focused issues. Um, does that make sense? Yes, I think in part, if I understand your question correctly, I mean, one of the difficulties on coal the reason a lot of us haven't run campaigns against them is very difficult, right? There's no point of sale. At least ExxonMobil, there's a gas station. Everybody's heard of it. You can boycott it, right? So with coal, nobody's heard of the coal companies, let alone the people who run them, right? But to me, a first wave of thinking on how to put pressure on these guys is you don't let them operate in the shadows. Um, if you, if, because when you get into what some of these companies have done, Southern Company and others, you'll find a, 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 amazing lists of legal infractions, not just environmental. When you go through um, the court records in, in the towns where they have their plants. And that's just the first wave of sort of managing your opposition. Why, why are they sort of, um, you know, taking their limos all around Washington and, you know, being, you know, blessed by both parties, not just the Republicans. I mean, our problem with coal is a Democratic Party, not the Republican Party, right? When you got, when, 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 when two environmental heroes, politicians, Markey and Waxman, had a, they had a marker bill. Waxman's bill was a, there was a 30 page marker bill. It wasn't a real bill yet. It was a gold standard bill. You know, I deployed Greenpeace organizers in 28 districts to get that thing support. But then when they actually wrote the legislation, it was just the biggest giveaway to the coal industry, right? Because they just said, hey, you know, it's the Democratic Party. It's what we've got to do. But it unfortunately cuts absolutely against the ecology of we have to stop grinding up mountains. So yes, we need that, that whole array of stuff that we haven't even touched them yet, really. Yeah. So I guess as a follow-up, um, do we need a movement to change our media, perhaps? Because I feel like in the current system, like, just the information doesn't get out there. People aren't talking, having the right conversation, even. And um, there are so many problems there that do we need a, a movement that focuses just on that and that's really nationwide? I think we just need to play our movement differently, right? I think we, we, we look at our media the wrong way. We look at the New York Times as this is a really helpful institution and they care, they get it, they, they have editorial writers and they believe we should stop global warming. That's part is true. But the New York Times, I talked to a reporter the other day who said, look, John, Climate Gate is the most fascinating story, which is code for we're going to win a Pulitzer by bringing down the IPCC. Because that's a big story. If you're a journalist, right? I, I know it's hard to hear. As an ecologist, you go, ah. But they're not ecologists. They're running an entertainment system. And, 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 and a story of that kind of conflict is fascinating. And we all read it, too. You know, that's a good, amazing story to read. We read it with anger, but we read it. I mean, they're going to, they're going to win a Pulitzer and they'll probably bring down the IPCC, right? That's the New York Times agenda. Except, here's what else is going on. In, this, in the social ecology of media, there's the blogosphere, the Twitterosphere. There's all this stuff going on. We don't need to beg the New York Times to run our stuff anymore. It used to be you would have to beg, lie, cheat, and steal. Maybe once every five years, you could squeak a story onto 60 Minutes, right? Still high bar if you can get a story on 60 Minutes and all these old people watch it and it's great but you know what it doesn't have the impact it once did so what do we do now people do their own videos they put the stuff up they link it suddenly they're gaming the uh, Google uh, search maximization before you know it 
just with your own stuff, just with your own blogs, your only own friendly websites, the stuff linked, um, and linked to your friends' blogs, and it's shown all this traffic, you can define your opponent. You can define your opponent with the new media. If you Google my name, John Pasacantando, one of the top hits will be a bio biography of me by a group called Activist Cash. It is an Exxon front group that wants to define me in a negative way. They figured this out. They're not waiting for the New York Times to say that I'm a schmuck. They say I'm a schmuck. And they work it into the thing. It's brilliant. It's really well done. All right, we can do the same thing. I am a schmuck. I am a schmuck. Uh, and uh, you look a lot more corporate, you know, than you're looking now. So, uh, yeah. Exactly. So there's my opponent of defining me. We can define them if we choose to. But if we just think knowledge is power, I gave my stuff to the New York Times. They didn't write it yet. You know, that's not the way to play. 